Euromax Highlights. And here's your host, Karin Helmstedt. Hi there, and a warm welcome to our Highlights edition, coming at you from the heart of Berlin with the following top stories. Fine feathers make fine birds. Costume designer Sandy Powell has two Oscar nominations. Home Sweet Home, a designer and her family love their prefab home in southern Norway. And you are what you eat. The new Nordic cuisine is based on seasonal and regional pros. Well, Europe did well this year when it comes to con the contenders for the coveted Academy Award happening on Sunday night in Los Angeles, which means that it will indeed be early Monday morning here in Berlin by the time that all is decided. And while European actors and films were indeed well represented, Sandy Powell of Britain did a veritable power play in the category Best Costume Design. And with three Oscars already to her credit, it's clear that she's a dominant force because this year she was even nominated for two separate films. Carol tells the story of a forbidden love in 1950s America. It's received an Oscar nomination for Best Costume Design. As have the fairy tale creations in Cinderella. Both nominations honour the work of the same designer, Sandy Powell of London. In films like Cinderella, her costumes play a key part in setting the tone for the characters. Big, bold and extravagant and colourful, it was meant to be like that. Carol, on the other hand, sort of the complete opposite. It was, it was contained and restrained and um, it was sort of based in reality. And it was sort of where you could see the dirt and the grime. Powell has been designing costumes for more than 30 years, working for directors like Martin Scorsese and Todd Haynes. The job involves more than creating a wardrobe. You have to observe with your eyes, but then equally you have to really try to get to the essence of the person you're dressing. I mean, the actor as a person, you have to sort of be able to sum them up immediately. You have to sort of guess what their neuroses are. In Carol, the goal was to bring New York City of the early 1950s back to life. <laughs> Kate Blanchett played the title role Carol aired. To create her costumes, Sandy Powell drew inspiration from vintage fashion magazines. Powell doesn't begin designing until she knows who's in the role. An actor like Kate Blanchett, of course, I mean, the costume designer's dream, really. I mean, she's, she's such an interesting woman. She's super intelligent, but not only that, she wears clothes really well. She has a real sense of her own style. But then she'll forget about that. She'll forget about the vanity in favour of doing what's best for the character. Sandy Powell has already won many awards, among them an Oscar for Shakespeare in Love. The costumes were her own creative interpretations of 16th century fashions. I mean, you don't stop being excited by it and, you know, honoured. I mean, what's the, the, the best thing about having Academy Award nominations is that the people who have nominated you are the people that do the same job. They're my peers and my colleagues, so that really is the most flattering thing and the greatest honour, actually. Alongside Carol and Cinderella, three other movies are competing for the Oscar for Best Costume Design. The Danish Girl, set in 1920s Copenhagen, the Revenant, which includes many hand-sewn costumes made of fur to recall clothing worn by 19th century American trappers. And the post-apocalyptic Mad Max Fury Road. I want them back! Sandy Powell is the only designer with two nominations. I think she's going to win for Carol, uh, if anything, just because that's a phenomenal film and what she did there, really recreating the 1950s uh, in style. Uh. With Powell, it seems her approach is, is so detailed and so precise um, without feeling like a museum piece. You have the feeling that uh, Kate Blanchett and uh, Rooney Mara are living in these, 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 these outfits. Part of the secret of Powell's success is that she draws her inspiration from wherever she can find it. Books, old photos, paintings, and even from contemporary fashions. I love fashion. I mean, I've really always been into fashion. I like it. But the reason I chose costume was because I think I, 
I enjoy storytelling and I enjoy the collaborative process. I like working with different people who are all doing different things and we're all working hard to the same end. And if everybody does their best and it all gels, then you get a great end product. And I also like not knowing what's happening next. The decision will be announced on February 28th in Hollywood. And then we'll find out if Carol or Cinderella, also starring Kate Blanchett, brings home the Oscar. But for her part, Powell won't say which of the two films is her own personal favorite. Well, speaking of beautiful clothes, Milan, Italy is currently fashion central until March the 1st with the annual Moda Donna Fashion Week. Now, this is an extravaganza of color and creativity with 73 shows over 10 days. And Italian photographer Piero Biazion is a real veteran in the business. Now, he's spent the last four decades documenting top models and top looks, which means that he has some 8 million outfits in his portfolio. And so we met up with him in action. Colorful and lavish, the runways of Milan are once again a buzz. Gucci, Prada, all the big names are in town for the Milano Moda Donna. And so is this man, photographer Piero Biasion. For the past 40 years, he's been a fixture at all the big fashion shows. His goal this week is to photograph at least half of the 73 shows on the program. I'm always looking everywhere for new trends and exciting designer ideas. They inspire me. As soon as the fashion shows get underway, I get a real shot of adrenaline. I can't wait to get started. Thanks to his nifty moped, 64-year-old Biasion is soon at the scene of the action. During Milan Fashion Week, he'll take some 80,000 photos for international fashion magazines. He's got his own routine. Before every fashion show, he secures his favorite place at the left of the runway. Italian designer Fausto Puglisi is presenting his latest collection, complete with dazzling embellishments and colors. It's the design details that Piero Biasion looks for. Here we can see a trend this season. We're seeing lots of jeweled designs with plenty of accessories and belt buckles combined with these oversized rings on multiple fingers. Biasion's dynamic runway shots and attention to detail got him his breakthrough back in the 1980s. Gianni Versace, Gianfranco Ferre and Giorgio Armani all hired his services. His first cover photo appeared on the German edition of Vogue. Piacione has photographed all the top models, and his work has graced the covers of over 60 international magazines. I specialize in creating photos that are a little different. I have some examples here. This moving, out-of-focus look. Many other photographers have copied me. But some have struggled to understand the dynamism of these pictures. Yasion says nowadays there are few opportunities to meet top models behind the scenes because the industry is ruled by big international companies and has become much more anonymous. The agencies see models a bit like chickens at a battery farm. They're replaceable. The same applies to us photographers, too. We get a bit of food thrown to us and rush from show to show. Max Mara is among Biasion's favorite labels. The head designer at the family-run coat maker is an old friend of his. And yet again, the striking color contrasts did not disappoint. Piero is a consummate professional, and with his experience, he's now effectively a fashion historian. He's observed the changing trends through the lens. He's known all the big designers. The fashion scene is indeed a constantly changing one, as is the media world. You're not on the left. Increasingly, Biasion finds himself jostling for a seat at shows with young bloggers, but it remains a labor of love and his pictures sell around the world. I still find fashion wonderful. 
I'm always delighted to see the beauty, the never-ending creativity and the search for something new. Piero Biasion will be in Milan till Monday, then he'll head straight to Paris for the next stop on the fashion circuit. And from Italy, we head now up to Norway, where building a house is a very expensive undertaking indeed. And so designer Belinda Bianca looked for a cheaper alternative, which she found with a prefab package house. And so she gave us a tour of the finished product. Kristiansund in southern Norway is a small town of about 85,000 people. Designer Belinda Bjerka's house is perched partway up a steep hill. Hi, my name's Belinda. Welcome to my home. Come on in. The house was completed in 2012 and is 200 square meters in all. What makes it unusual is that the house was built from about 20 prefab slabs of concrete. They were prepared to size and assembled on location in just five days. Björke and her family wanted to move into the house quickly, but that's not the only reason she went with prefab. I thought, what about building something, you know, based like almost like an indus industrial building? You know, they pop up like that really fast and um, with materials that stand the, you know, the test of time and weather and everything. And this place here has got like all the weather of Norway and it's bad, just coming in. So that's, you know, I wanted to make it like a Lego concept. To absorb sound, Bjerka had the ceilings of the two-story house lined in local pine wood. It also provides a warm contrast to the cool concrete. She focused on using materials from Norway. This unusual wallpaper is also a local product. I've been in love with it since I was, you know, a little girl. Um, it comes in a lot of houses from the 70s. It's called uh, Biri Tapet. So it's from a little valley in Norway uh, where they're actually making it by their hands um, um, and by st uh, with straw. And um, they've picked a special color uh, of the um, thread, so you can actually define it a bit yourself. I just love it. Norwegian products also dominate the interior furnishings. These chairs, made of leather and metal, also combine warm and cool elements. They're from Belinda Bjerke's own company, Norwegian Design House. What we're doing is to take Norwegian designers and produce their beautiful work. Uh, also try to find um, factories or uh, craftsmen uh, that are in Norway and can help us uh, to make um, the designs uh, to the full. The highlight of the house is the large terrace adjacent to the living room. The huge south-facing windows allow for plenty of sunlight. That's especially important in Norway, where the sun often shines for just a few hours a day in the winter. <laughs> what I've tried when I designed the house was actually just to, OK, open up as much as possible, you know, with the windows, and to get the light that you can actually get. Um, there's a lot of, you know, free medicine in that. <laughs> People tend to get depressed up here and there is a reason for it. So um, we wanted to have as much light as possible. The ground floor is devoted to the family's three children. Along with the children's bedrooms, there's also plenty of other space for them to play and burn off some energy. Like the homemade climbing wall. There are a lot of grey days. Need to get the steam off uh, without going out. Uh, climbing is a good way. Uh, number two, uh, Knut, uh, my other half, is a keen climber and he also wants to encourage the kids to, to start climbing. Concrete and wood, dark and light, cold and warmth. 
Belinda Bjerka's house is a successful study in contrasts and well suited for her family. I had a great time. I hope you did the same. See you soon. Bye. Well, anyone who's into food knows that Nordic cuisine has not only come seriously into fashion over the last decade, but it's also got its own firm place in the gourmet scene as a cuisine that places a strong emphasis on the reinterpretation of traditional foods as well as a serious code of seasonal and regional products. Well, just this week, the already rocking gastronomic scene in Northern Europe got more stars in its crown when the Nordic edition of the Michelin Guide awarded the region's first three stars to restaurants in Copenhagen and in Oslo. And so we went to the Danish capital to see why it gets top marks. Temperatures in Copenhagen can get rather chilly in winter. Trying to live only from local produce doesn't sound very practical, but that's just what the devotees of the new Nordic cuisine do. The Radio Restaurant, for example, uses exclusively regional ingredients. So this is one of my favorite vegetables, Syriac, that we can bake or fry or even serve raw. Shoes of ramson or wild garlic, as it is called. And then you've got the um, black cabbage. It's a kind of creating a, a dishes, a food that is that reflects nature where you are. The Spanish cuisine that was dominating in, in, in the early 2000s was extremely technical and uh, getting further and further away from everything natural. So we said now it's time to come back to nature. Chefs from around the world are drawing inspiration from the new Nordic cuisine. Lifestyle magazines in Britain and the United States are singing the praises of what they call the Viking diet. It's a trend, but will it last? It actually began back in 2003 in a restaurant called Noma, which was started by Klaus Meyer and René Rezepi. These days, Noma boasts two Michelin stars and has been named the best restaurant in the world four times by British Restaurant Magazine. The way they did that just completely changed everything we knew about restaurants. They were serving plates that looked like forest floors and uh, beaches in the north of Denmark and so on. And it was made of uh, the produce that they could find in our uh, close surroundings. New Nordic cuisine is turned into a gold mine for Klaus Meyer. Nowadays, he runs six restaurants and 75 staff cafeterias around Copenhagen. His delis specialize in regional produce from their own farms. His name has turned into a trademark. I mean, we never meant for, for this phenomenon, the new Nordic cuisine, to be reserved for uh, a culinary elite. What we dreamt of was that this should come into the hands and lives of as many people as possible. Food blogger Mia Irene Christensen has also taken up the cause. She tries to put the ideas into practice in her daily meals and organizes <laughs> cooking courses in her home. It's a new twist on a centuries-old tradition of following the seasons. The beetroot has really, you know, gotten modern again, and also some of the other old, old school, um, you know, root vegetables like parsnip and um, what's the other one, parsley root, and all the cabbages. When the Danes are eating so much cabbage now, it's all about knowing how to to prepare it, and maybe not use the traditional method like beetroots. We used to, you know, make soup of or we used to pickle it, but when you use it raw, it's just a completely different experience. The trend has picked up support from a recent Danish study indicating the new Nordic cuisine is healthy and promotes weight loss. Cabbage and root vegetables are complemented by legumes, berries, whole grain foods and fish, and meat only sparingly, never from factory farming. Traditional pickling, stewing and preserving are undergoing a revival. This is the finished pork cheeks. You braise it for about 45 to one and a half hour, depending on how you do it. Um, so in a few hours, you have a lovely pot dish. Um, and it's a cut that we kind of forgotten about. They went from being something you could almost get free at the butchers because nobody wanted it. Until now, you need to pay a lot of money for them. The return to traditional natural ingredients is nothing new. 
Industrially processed foods are also frowned on by the raw food diet, clean eating, slow food, and others. But none are as extreme as the Paleolithic diet, whose disciples try to eat like their Stone Age ancestors. There are even Paleolithic style restaurants. If we cannot get this simplicity in our daily work life or in our relationships, in the society that surrounds us, uh, that is incredibly demanding, then we could probably seek that simplicity in our own kitchen. Many trends have turned out to be flashes in the pan, but not the new Nordic cuisine. Its popularity has only grown, even as standard family fare. But the old Vikings themselves might have looked slightly different at dinner time. A picture is worth a thousand words, or so the saying goes, but we're going to now look at the words themselves, or rather, the letters that actually make up a word. And if you're someone who loved to play with your alphabet soup when you were a child, well, you'll love the Berlin concept store called Type Hype, where the owners recently walked us through the A to Z of what we call sign design. Letters are everywhere but they don't always come together to form words. The Type Hype store in Berlin sells only products featuring single printed letters, posters, cards, books, and even food and drink. Jochen Redeker and Kirsten Dietz, both designers, opened the store in 2013. I've always been fascinated by design, and letters often get overlooked during the creative process. But we read billions of them in our everyday lives. I had a personal interest in making them prettier. The idea to feature them on nice products was the idea behind the store. It's a lot of fun. Here's a functioning printing press and metal type case, like you'd have found in a 19th century print works. The store also includes a milk bar. There's a special reason for that. Back in the day, compositors working with type were exposed to poisonous lead in the air. Calcium minimized the effects, so the apprentices used to be given milk. We decided to open a milk bar, too. We do have pure milk on the menu, but customers don't necessarily drink that. But milk doesn't taste bad in coffee, either, so we opened a cafe. Artists have embraced the aesthetic power of letters, too. Spanish artist Jaume Plenza creates enormous structures out of them. The messages contained in his work range from poetry to social commentary. German artist Dirk Kreike creates images out of the characters produced by his typewriter. He creates his motifs by repeatedly typing words and sentences, forming distinctive patterns on the page. He calls his works typewriter drawings. British artist Kira Rathbone also uses a typewriter to create pictures. Her portraits have appeared on the covers of books and magazines. They can cost up to 6,000 euros. Berlin boasts a unique collection of letter forms. More than 800 works are on display. Recently, the Buchstaben or Letter Museum had to leave its former location in central Berlin. Its founder, Barbara Deschamps, hopes to reopen the museum at a new location. She discovered her passion for letters 10 years ago. We've realized that every letter has had its own life. We often take old letters from public spaces. The backstories are really interesting. Back in Kirsten Dietz and Jochen Redeker's Berlin concept store. Visitors to the store's website can create their own favorite words. I've always enjoyed playing around with letters, even while learning to read. And maybe now that I've learned to read, in creating products.
And that is all A-L-L -L for this edition of our highlights. I hope you enjoyed it. And until we meet again, all the best, of course, from us here in Berlin. Tschüss und auf Wiedersehen.